Good evening, everybody. Making America safe again. President Trump laying out his plan to overhaul our broken borders, our broken immigration system, and our broken borders. The proposal begins with the most complete and effective border security package ever assembled by our country. This plan was not developed, I'm sorry to say, by politicians. It was designed with significant input from our great law enforcement professionals to detail what they need to make our border, which is 100 percent operationally secure. 100 percent. And the president's proposal also introduces, for the first time ever, merit-based immigration and rooting out fraudulent claims of asylum. We must also restore the integrity of our broken asylum system. Our nation has a proud history of affording protection to those fleeting government persecutions. Unfortunately, legitimate asylum seekers are being displaced by those lodging frivolous claims. These are frivolous claims to gain admission into our country. And tonight we take a further look at the president's proposal. Chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett, National Border Patrol Union President Brandon Judd, Congressman Mark Green, all among our guests tonight. Also, for the first time since he took office, President Trump has the radical Dems and the deep state reeling. The cartoonish Obama era spy masters, James Comey, John Brennan, James Clapper, in profound jeopardy tonight in the face of the Attorney General's investigations into the attempted overthrow of the Trump presidency. The radical Dems and the Obama spy masters know they've been found out, and the cowardly spy masters are now blaming one another. Mark Simone, among our guests tonight, will take that up, and also uh, the latest entry into the radical Dems uh, presidential sweepstakes as tensions build in the Middle East. Saudi leaders calling on the United States to carry out strikes against Iran for the drone attacks against a Saudi pipeline. President Trump says, not so fast. General Jack Keane joins us here tonight as well. Our top story, the president today presented his plan for border security and merit-based immigration, calling on the radical Dems to either support it now or reap the repercussions in 2020. And if for some reason, possibly political, we can't get the Democrats to approve this merit-based high security plan, then we will get it approved immediately after the election when we take back the House, keep the Senate, and of course, hold the presidency. But Rhino Senator Lindsey Graham not awaiting his turn and talking out of turn. Graham can be an odd sort of fellow and has no problem alternating his political support. Sometimes for the president, sometimes for the Dems, nearly always for K Street and the Koch brothers. Today saying President Trump must work with the Democrats on the illegal immigrant issue. Here's Graham in curious competition with the president's plan announcement today. You need democratic votes for something to become law. I can't imagine a solution to our immigration problems that doesn't deal with the 11 million. So, logically, this is a uniting Republicans around two strong pillars, future immigration to be merit-based, not family-based, a strong border. That's what we're for, and for it to become law, you got to work with Democrats. Our first guest tonight advised President Trump on the economic impact of the new immigration proposals, uh, potentially generating as much as $600 billion in GDP. Uh, joining us tonight is Kevin Hassett, the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and it is great to have you with us, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, uh, Lou. It's great to be here. This proposal, uh, you had an uh, important part to play in its uh, uh, formulation. Uh, the idea that uh, a immigration plan, a border security plan, could generate economic growth, that's a fascinating concept and a, uh, I, I think perhaps an unheard of uh, economic impact statement on a border plan, an immigration plan in the country's history. 
Right. Well, you know, the president, as you know, all the way back to the campaign, has said that we need to switch to a merit-based system. And, uh, and he was right. He also said, you know, the politicians didn't design this plan. Well, he's a politician. He was in the middle of it all. But, but he did tell the border security guys to give him their best advice. And on the legal immigration side, he told us at the Council of Economic Advisors to look at best practices around the world and think about what immigration plan could maximize economic growth here in the U.S. And so we think that if the president's plan became law, that it would add about 2% to GDP. Well, we've had some sort of technical problem uh, breaking the, uh, the line. I, he, it's he, a helicopter behind me, I think. That, oh, uh, <laughs> well, that, that helicopter uh, uh, must have yeah. interrupted our signal, but we apologize to our audience and, uh, and to you. Okay, so you can hear me now, Lou? I sure can. Thank you. Okay, yeah, and, and so the point is just that the president instructed us to examine best practices around the world and to present, you know, ideas about how we could maximize economic growth, maximize the welfare of blue-collar workers, create the most jobs with an immigration reform. And what we did is we basically moved, as he said, since the campaign to a merit-based system mm -hmm. that we think will really uh, take the economy from the level we're at to a higher level. You know, you know, Kevin, as you're talking, it, it just strikes me over the two decades of uh, intense, uh, uh, well, uh, intense opposition in the public arena on the ideas of the impact of illegal, legal immigration. Uh, we're starting to actually see some uh, empirical evidence uh, that security makes sense, uh, that controlling immigration makes sense, uh, but not only in the interest of the nation's uh, sovereignty and security, but economically, and that is a stride forward, and I want to compliment you and the president Thank for you. doing so. Uh, let's also turn to uh, the idea uh, that uh, this, this president, for the first time, would have 100% border security. Uh, right. Is that the condition precedent to, quote unquote, uh, immigration reform, or is it a contemporaneous uh, and uh, uh, process uh, that we could expect? Right. Well, you know, I think that what we put forward were two pillars today. Mm -hmm. And you heard Senator Graham, who, who you were critical of. But, yes, but I he was. Said these are, but he said these are two great pillars. And he's right. Like, the, it's an important pillar of uh, border security. He also and wanted to also negotiate for you, Kevin, if you're going to bring this up. Uh, one of the things that a, a, a Senate Judiciary Committee might consider uh, with his background and checkered it is and who he supports and what he supports I hope that uh, Kevin can still hear me because this is so yeah, important I can still hear you, yeah. <laughs> for you to hear. Uh, he is competing with the president and he is anticipating a, a negotiation. He's doing more than anticipating a negotiation with the radical Dems. He is, uh, he is encouraging it uh, and uh, effectively demanding at the same time as you're putting out your plan. I know you're a nice guy. The president is a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy. I think <laughs> he is. Nice I think he is being an absurd irritant and an unnecessary one uh, in uh, what you all are trying to do, which is a serious proposal to, uh, to create border security and a rational immigration plan. I think right. the senator needs to wait his turn. Well, well, you know, I, I don't want to talk about the senator. You know, I can't do that. But the thing I want to say, though, is that, that right I'm now... I'm glad you didn't bring system, it up then. <laughs> our immigration system is totally broken, right? And, and so right now, if you're a kid in Kenya and you wonder, I want to go to the U.S. and have a better life, then you don't... It's re impossible to figure out what to do. Like, you got to hire lawyers, and there's like 100 different visas. And so under the president's plan, you can go to a website that says, hey, if you take a civics test, if you speak English, and, you know, maybe you have to get some vocational education, then you got enough points so that you can get in. And so we think that what we do is we make this the land of opportunity again. Uh, and again, the issue of security. Security becomes a condition precedent for these immigration changes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because if you don't, if you don't have strong borders, if you don't have security, then it doesn't matter what what laws you have. And, and, and so, if you don't do pillar one, then pillar two is really irrelevant. And that's that's the point you're driving at, and it's true. Oh. And, and it's uh, effectively uh, immigrant neutral in the numbers, at least. Correct. Uh, and, and that's encouraging and has not been a suggestion before. Uh, and to be merit-based, my gosh. I mean, this is, you know, I expect hallelujah choruses uh, <laughs> around the White House for, for coming up with this uh, proposal. Uh, it is a uh, terrific beginning. We know the process. And if we didn't know that the process was uh, going to be, uh, at times, uh, 
intent, so we wouldn't need we wouldn't need <laughs> Senator Graham to remind us. Hey, Kevin, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, we appreciate Louis. it. Thanks Good luck lot. with all of this. Thanks. Thank you. Up next, how President Trump's immigration proposal is playing with the men and women who protect our border. We're joined by the head of the Border Patrol's union. Also, the new controversial tool to grade college SATs by adding another score that parents have to worry about. Uh, the country is a little riled up about this one. There, there's something about consolidating power, whether it's political, whether it's economic or academic. Uh, and that's what they're doing and we'll see how that's playing. Stay with us, that and much more right after these quick messages. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi today saying that neither she nor the radical Dems have denied the crisis at our southern border. Well, let me just say this. We have never not said that there was a crisis. There is a humanitarian crisis at the border, and some of it uh, uh, provoked by the actions taken by the administration. Provokes actions taken by the administration. If that's an explanation as to why the radical Dems are not looking to the national interest and doing something about the national emergency, well, good luck to her. Good luck to us. Pelosi conveniently forgot the dozens of times that she condemned President Trump's national border emergency. The president's manufactured crisis president decided that he imagined or whatever had the mythology of a crisis at the border. President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis. Mr. President, the evidence of what's happening there does not support the crisis that you described. If you could understand everything she said, you were way ahead of me. Uh, but uh, it was denial of the crisis and the national emergency. Border Patrol arresting a Honduras man. He tried to cross illegally across our border uh, with a six-month-old infant, an infant that wasn't his. The man was caught smuggling that baby near Hidalgo, Texas. The child has been transferred to the custody of the Department of Health and Human Services for placement. Joining us tonight is the president of the National Border Patrol Council, Brandon Judd. Brandon has voluntarily deployed to assist at the Rio Grande Valley sector of the border. Uh, and I, first, I want to compliment you for doing so. Uh, I know that uh, it's, it's an act of leader, but it is also one that you did not have to take. And I just want to say congratulations to you. And I, I've got to believe that all of the agents you represent uh, feel very good about the fact. What is your... Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brandon. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I get to wear two hats. I get to put on a uniform. I get to go out and patrol the border and actually see what's going on. And then I get to put on the political hat as well and, and go and try to do what's best for the American public. But when you look at the crisis that we currently face and you look at what uh, Nancy Pelosi said, she made a statement and she did not back it up with any evidence. And that's what we see too often. When you look at this crisis and when you look at what this president is dealing with, he is telling Congress right Right now, you can get on board with me, you can be part of the solution, and if you're not, I'm going to put you behind me, and I am going to use the authorities that I currently have, and I'm going to fix the crisis myself. And that's exactly what he's doing. When he comes right. up with plans, when you, when you think about training Border Patrol agents to start the asylum process immediately, um, giving the Border Patrol agents the authority to conduct credible mm -hmm. fear interviews, these are the types of outside of the box thinking that the American public knew that they were going to get when they elected him the president right. and frankly it's these types of things that is going to that are going to help us secure the border regardless of whether Congress is behind him or not yeah as a matter of fact I frankly I, I think the president as I said earlier in the broadcast he's a nice guy much nicer than me I would have already said adios to the Congress uh, you've made your choice live with it we'll see you in 2020 at the ballot box and you're going to get crushed uh, the the idea of moving these immigration judges, talking about this with Tom Holman, former acting ICE director, uh, Mark Morgan uh, previously, about interior enforcement, 
all of all of a sudden you know, we've got some uh, people talking about innovative ways to uh, take responsibility to own this crisis and not whine about Congress, not wait on uh, you know possible developments, but deal with what we got. That's the American way: innovate, change, adapt, and absolutely uh, deal with the issue in front of us. Uh, and you look at it, and he's listening to people that have been there, that have done that. You're, you're talking about Tom Homan, the, the former ISA ERO director, uh, Mark Morgan, an FBI who, who was at the top of, of this investigative level, um, who, frankly, in an investigative position is is as good as you're going to get. Um, great person for ICE. Frankly, I would take him as my CBP commissioner in a heartbeat if I could. But if you look at this and you look at who the president is relying upon and who he's listening to, he's listening to the right people at the right time to address this issue and frankly we're going to get it done. Uh, Lou, I watched you when you e even when you were with CNN and you used to beat this drum and shine, shine a spotlight on this issue. One day and I really do believe that this is true, you're going to come on TV and you're going to say, "Whew, we actually secured the border." And that's what I think is is going to happen and I think it's it, it, we're working towards that direction. And I believe this president uh, is the country's only, not just simply the last best chance, the only chance this country has to get this uh, border uh, secure, to get our immigration system rational and right, uh, and uh, assure that this country's values are preserved. We are a nation uh, that has always welcomed immigrants on our terms, yeah, not on theirs. Doing the right we have thing. always doing welcomed those seeking asylum who truly are desperate for uh, security and sanctuary. We've always, uh, as a nation with open arms, but we have yeah, never had our borders overrun in the history of this country until now. Yeah, and he rolled that plan out today, and that plan is a very sound plan. Frankly, it would be a plan that would be accepted on a bipartisan basis if it wasn't, um, if it didn't have the Trump name behind it, just because the Democrats dislike him so much. This is a great plan. It is a plan that could secure the border, but frankly, Lou, if, the, if Congress doesn't get behind him on it, Oh, well, he's going to continue to push within the authorities that he has to do what he needs to do. I'm on the border on a, on a very regular basis. I put that uniform on. I love patrolling the border. I see the, the, what the agents want to do, and the president is behind those agents in trying to get that done. I want to ask you, uh, on those agents, right now, because of all of the duties they have to, to contend with because of this surge uh, of uh, dealing with apprehensions of a million illegal immigrants, we're being told by some that we're talking about 75 percent of those agents are not on the border right now, actually involved in other functions, activities, jobs, and responsibilities. Is that is that about right? That it's it's about 50 percent uh, right now, and and, and it, it can be different in different different places. You're right. That's too way too many. We have to have those people on the border. But you have to understand that's what the cartels are doing. These people are extremely intelligent. This is a very big business. And make no mistake, although it's an illegal business, it's still a business, and they're profit driven. And what they know that what, that they have to do is they have to pull my agents out of the field to create these gaps in the border to where they can run their higher value products right behind us. And that's what they're doing. When they throw these people across right. the border, and literally they do, and they're, they're seeking asylum, they're taking the agents out of the field so that they can create those gaps. And if we don't have the proper intelligence, if we don't have the sound operations, they're going to beat us every single time. Brandon Judd, always good to talk with you. Always learn something. Appreciate it. Thank you. Brandon Judd. The organization that oversees the SAT test has got new plans for America, planning to assign an adversity score to every student who takes it. The College Board says they will use that number to help understand students' social and economic backgrounds, uh, using factors like crime and poverty rates in the students' high schools and neighborhoods. The scores will then be offered to 150 colleges this fall before expanding the program next year. Are you wondering who voted on this? Who decided this? Well, it's the College Board. Uh, deciding for all of us. Isn't that wonderful? Including the colleges that our kids and our grandkids would like to one day attend. Still ahead, the battle over abortion is escalating. Another state moves to enact a strict new law. 
that prohibits abortion. That's right, abortion, not, not choice, because choices are being made on all sides of the issue. Plus, President Trump takes on Mayor Big Bird, or Wrong Way Bill, as we call him here in New York. Bill de Blasio is the latest. I can't believe it. I just heard that the worst mayor in the history of New York City, and without question, the worst mayor in the United States, is now running for president. It will never happen. I'm pretty good at predicting things like that. I would be very surprised to see him in there for a long period, but it's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. We've got to find out what's really going on here with uh, Mayor Big Bird or whatever you want to call him. We are bringing in the big artillery on de Blasio. Mark Simone joins us. Uh, he has a very interesting insight into all of this. You'll love it. We're coming right back. Raising. The RNC raising almost $16 million in April. The party also has 30, almost $35 million on hand and uh, no debt at all. In stark contrast to what's going on with the uh, radical Dems. Today's RNC announcement comes as New York's uh, mayor, Bill de Blasio, has actually become the Dems' 23rd presidential candidate. You may have thought the Republicans were out of their minds in 2016, but the Dems are going a whole new place. And President Trump uh, welcoming him with this tweet tonight. Quote, Bill de Blasio is the worst mayor in the history of New York City. He won't last long. And the president, as usual, is on point, according to a Quinnipiac poll. I, I love this poll. 76% of New Yorkers, New York City voters, don't want to see Bill de Blasio run for president in 2020. And if you get the idea that's because they want him to stay in New York, no, he's term limited and he is done. And apparently so are uh, all of the 76% uh, uh, percent of the New Yorkers who plan to vote. Joining us tonight is WOR radio personality, Mark Simone. Mark, great to have you with us. I mean, 23 candidates, another one, Bill de Blasio jumps in. I, and, and the city is snarling at the prospect <laughs> that he will run. What's going on here? Well, first of all, he's the, the president is right. He's the worst mayor we've ever had. His main accomplishment, he's turned the whole place into a homeless camp. He's opened homeless camps on Park Avenue. He's trying to put one next to Carnegie Hall. He's a mess. How did he get reelected? He is the king of donors. Democratic donors, Republican donors, I'm talking about the big money guys. They love him. They all have his cell number. Why do they love him? Oh, as they'll tell you, I could wake him up at 3 in the morning. I'll get anything I need. So his main problem is... As long as they put forward a sufficient uh, contribution? Well, a guy will show up every month yeah, for right. 50, 100, or whatever. If it goes to a pack, the man's not personally corrupt. He's not taking any, but right. he's assembling a huge pack of money, and he's term limited out. So how do you raise money now? By running for president. Ah, we have plot, more. the plot uh, both thickens and is now more obvious. Yeah, we have you. massive real estate developers in New York. And they all need dozens of permits, zoning, uh, all kinds of uh, variances. And they don't blink at giving 200000 to a presidential campaign. So how do you think he'll do? He's not, it's, uh, he's not, he doesn't show up any polls. People aren't anticipating his arrival as the 23rd uh, radical Dem he will, 2020 hopeful. He'll do great. He won't get a single vote, but that pack will have five million in it pretty soon. And he'll, he won't be able to get the smile off his face. So this is basically uh, a scam. It's, he's not the only one. Uh, well, no, I wouldn't suggest. To say, we're in New York City for crying out loud, Mark. He's certainly not the only one. But what I'm saying to you is it, he, he is uh, just running to raise a little money and uh, get comfortable with the, uh, the bank account in the pack. Uh, he's running to raise a lot of money, and uh, he will. And if we pass the law, this is the law we need. If you lose, you don't win. All the money gets returned. That should be the law. You can yeah. hang on to this money forever. Uh, yeah, but if you do that, you won't have 23 radical Dems running for president. Yeah. Well, you, and, you're and, and, and then we wouldn't have this much fun. Well, the party has lost control. Both parties have lost control. Now that sounds right. Yeah, if they had control, they would have stopped Donald Trump. They didn't want him. He was going to disrupt their game. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, so they, he got control of the Republicans. The Democratic Party, the Podesta types, they have no control anymore. Well, if, that's a good thing. 
Well, but if they did, they'd keep it down to six or seven candidates. You know what? I'd, I'd rather see 23 and none of them be worth a darn uh, than to have six or seven, none of whom are worth a darn, but are just simply representing the, the establishment of either the Democratic or Republican Party. I mean, think about that. If we had had a limitation, uh, it's likely that, the, that President Trump uh, wouldn't be president uh, because of all the establishment uh, nonsense that goes on. Uh, the, I think this is a... Oh, you... I, I'm not ready for this reform. I, I don't want a law... Just the podium company loves it. They never had to make 24 <laughs> podiums for one night. And think about the, the, the floor managers uh, for all of the networks trying to figure out what they're going to do with, with the cameras. I, I mean, this, this is going to be so much fun. I cannot wait. And people forget de Blasio was one of Hillary's campaign managers for years. Oh, that explains her great success. Well, but he learned how to raise money. He learned how to put together a pack. <laughs> well, so did she. Has anybody ever figured how they made so much money? It's really interesting, the, the Clintons, I mean. Uh, well, we know how they made, again, like uh, these Democrats in New York, pay for play. As soon as they didn't have any power to pass around, well, no money's coming. Did the Clinton Foundation have anything to do with that? Do oh. you think that we should investigate that? <laughs> it's amazing. It's taken in hundreds of millions a year. As soon as she's not Secretary of State, a dollar fifty every year. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Thanks for the insight. This is, this is a hoot. Who would have dreamed that the Democrats would so quickly overtake the Republicans of 2016? 23 candidates. Mark Simone is going to give us the lowdown in each and every one of them in the weeks ahead. Uh, right? It's the only debate we're going to use the bleachers for the candidates. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, probably a, that's probably about what it'll be. Thanks so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Mark Simone. Restrictive abortion laws. Wow. Spreading all across the country. Setting up. What is their purpose? To set up a Supreme Court challenge to Roe v. Wade. Missouri State Senate passing a bill today that would outlaw abortion at eight weeks of pregnancy. With the state seemingly on track to pass that legislation, they would join the six other states that have passed abortion restrictions this year. There are also eight other states now considering abortion restrictions of some fashion. Uh, this is suddenly, uh, a, it is a, without a question, a wildfire of legislation suddenly upon us. Uh, and uh, the issue of pro-choice, uh, abortion, our life uh, is also upon us. We're going to see what happens next very soon. Up next, Dems and Rhinos alike pressuring the president for information on his plans for Iran. We take that up and much more with General Jack Keane right after the break. Stay with us. Eight congressional leaders today received a classified briefing on Iran after radical Dems and Rhinos alike cried foul, demanding answers from the White House and the Pentagon on the Iran threat. The confusion coming from our allies simply shows the need for the White House and the Pentagon to brief Congress. The American people have been kept in the dark. It is disgraceful and despicable that we're on the verge of war. And the American people are given this kind of confused and chaotic picture. I would tell the administration you should pick up the phone and call members of Congress so that we don't have a microphone put in our face. Ask us about why you're doing something when we have no clue. He doesn't want war with Iran. Joining us tonight, retired four-star general, Fox Business Chief Strategic Analyst, General Jack Keane. General, good to see you. It's, uh, it's remarkable to see uh, Blumenthal and Graham uh, doing the bipartisan thing and whining like babies about uh, what they know or don't know about a national security uh, issue that, frankly, isn't on their committee, uh, their committee list. Yeah, they... Um Members of the Senate Intelligence Community have been briefed already, as the House Intelligence Committee has as well. But let me see if I can help our viewers understand uh, what's happening here in terms of setting the table. One, and me too. And me too. We, we got some good words used, credible, specific intelligence. What does that mean? Translation is likely multiple sources 
and reliable sources bring us bring the government to that conclusion so what do you mean by multiple sources satellite is a source saw something taking place in terms of preparation maybe missiles being put on boats or ships mm -hmm. because we're bringing patriot missiles in there which is designed to defend against that as well as Aegis cruisers second thing is what other kind of sources? Well, we have human intelligence sources and we have signals intelligence sources where we monitor conversations. Our own as well as our allies. Yeah. And our human intelligence sources are maybe informants on the ground, the so-called spies. Mm -hmm. I suspect one of those other sources has kicked in and it made it very reliable in terms of intent. In other words, you see preparation, missiles on ships. Now they hear someone communicating to someone else the intent to do something. That is why it's so credible in terms of intelligence. You know, I still have enough confidence uh, in, in our government uh, that when the President of the United States orders a, a carrier strike force into the uh, uh, Arabian Sea uh, because of a credible threat, uh, you know, I take, I take our national security, our, our President at his word. Uh, what is interesting are the number of people who are sitting here talking about uh, fake news, as the president described it, 120,000 troops to the region. Right. The president saying in, in front of God and everybody, I don't want war. Uh, I believe him. Do you? Oh, yeah. So we're bringing a carrier strike group, as you described it, Patriot battery missiles and bombers in. What, what's the reason for that? Two reasons. One, to deter the Iranians from doing anything, mm -hmm. letting them know, one, we know what you're up to, and two, we're serious. If you do something, we're going to react to it. So that's what that mission is all about. And I think what's happened here is when the president and his national security team meets, Lou, they go through a whole range of options mm -hmm. against whatever the threat is that they have. And one of those, uh, it's, uh, do we respond measuredly, deliberately? Do we sp respond overwhelmingly to convince them never to do it again? All those options would be laid out for the president to see with all the risks associated. And then another big question has to be asked. If, if the intelligence is so good right now, should we conduct a preemptive attack on them now? Mm -hmm. uh, that likely would be discussed with the risk associated with it. I would not recommend that if I was there, but, I, but it gets discussed. Sure. And, and then it spins off into the media because people because somebody wants to leak it out and look like a big shot with inside knowledge. Yeah. And it's unfortunate that the president can't meet in the Situation Room top secret compartmentalized well, information. I, I have to believe a lot of folks uh, share my concerns about how is it that we are seeing more leaks from uh, from the White House uh, against and other uh, departments and agencies, but more leaks against this president than any we've seen in history. No president in history has done more and better than this president in the Oval Office, and it's outrageous. And I, I absolutely agree. I, and I can't one on one level. I just simply don't understand why it is not technologically possible to stop that sort of nonsense. Well, I think it's possible to get after it. Uh, it's also hard to find, but it's. I think if you really went after it quite a bit, um, people would understand it's just serious. But it's fundamentally uh, a lack of loyalty. I mean, yeah. you take an oath, you're serving the country. Um, if you disagree with the president. The, and get the hell out. First of all, tell him. And this president, yeah. I, I know for a fact, and you do as well, he accepts that disagreement, and then he'll challenge it and so-called sharpen his pencil a little bit. Yeah. So we're not going to war over Iran, Lou. That's a fact, okay? We may, if they hit us, we'll strike back and we'll strike up. As we would any country. Of course. So, uh, as always, General, it's great to have you here. It's good, good to talk to you, Lou. Thanks so much. Up next, the Koch brothers crying foul over the president's tariffs on Chinese goods. The Koch brothers, the poor darlings, they say tariffs hurt the American people. You didn't know that the Koch brothers spoke for the American people, did you? Right here on Lou Dobbs Tonight, you learned that. Uh, frustrated Game of Thrones fans, take, take action. We'll tell you how they want to take action and the result they want. This is important asserting there that spying did uh, indeed occur against the 2016 Trump presidential campaign.
But that apparently isn't the thinking of the FBI director, Christopher Wray. Listen to what Wray constructed saying this today before the Senate Appropriations Committee. When FBI agents conduct investigations against alleged mobsters, suspected terrorists, other criminals, do you believe that they're engaging in spying when they're following FBI investigative policies and procedures? Well, that's not the term I would use. There are lots of people who have different colloquial phrases. I believe that the FBI is engaged in investigative activity, and part of investigative activity includes surveillance activity of different shapes and sizes. And to me, the key question is making sure that it's done by the book. Well, just for reference, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines spying as, amongst other uh, definitions, to watch secretly, usually for hostile uh, purposes to watch secretly as a spy. Even former Director of National Intelligence, uh, Director James Clapper, admits that the FBI's actions against the Trump presidential campaign do, in fact, meet the definition of spying. It took him a while to come to that conclusion. Perhaps Ray will be next in line to do so. Joining us tonight, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton. Uh, Tom, uh, this is going, this is, you have had some of the busiest years of your career, I know. Uh, and they're not letting up, are they? Uh, tomorrow, the, uh, the Judiciary Committee in the House uh, prepares for a contempt uh, vote against uh, the, uh, uh, William Barr, the Attorney General, a contempt of Congress. This is on its face madness. Uh, and mindless. Your thoughts? Well, the Attorney General has been uh, remarkably transparent with the Mueller report, and so he's going to be found in contempt of Congress by the House over an argument over whether documents that are he's legally prohibited from giving uh, them uh, uh, should be released anyway, contrary to federal law, something that could put him in jail and others in jail if they were released inappropriately. Uh, it shows you this is just another abuse of the power in a long series of abuses well, of power by the Democrats that began during the Obama administration, continued through the Mueller FBI right. operation, and now the baton has been passed to Jerry Nadler at the DOJ to continue to abuse power to harass President Trump. Uh, it, uh, and, of course, you know, it's a nice distraction from the fact that the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Party apparatus, has been caught using donor dollars to collude with the Russia intelligence to attack uh, a domestic political mm -hmm. opponent. But that attention they can't escape ultimately. Uh, the, law, the lawmen and, can't be distracted, I believe that ought to be the case. And, and in, in this instance too, with Nadler, uh, the, where, should the, where should the White House go with this? Where should the Attorney General go with, the, uh, go with this? The logical first impression, it seems to me, is go to court uh, and uh, end this nonsense. You know, typically you go to court uh, over document fights and subpoena fights, whether the subpoenas are abusive mm -hmm. or not. You can seek protection from the court from having uh, to uh, accede to them. Or if there are documents you want to withheld uh, under uh, court protection, you can make the argument to the court. And I think there's going to be a strong argument that can't be overcome without Congress literally changing the law to withhold grand jury material. You know, we always want to see grand jury material at Judicial Watch under the Freedom of Information Act, but we can't because the law doesn't allow us right. to do it. And you've got to change the law to fix it, if indeed it needs to be fixed in this regard. But, so, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental distraction from the fact, for instance, as you point out uh, at the top of this uh, segment, the FBI has no leadership. It's it's stunning to watch and to listen to that. Uh, There's that that's that contempt battle. issue there. I mean, the FBI at the same time right now, that FBI director is running an agency who thinks no text messages its own should be subject to the Freedom of Information yeah. Act, protecting the same gang that tried to overthrow the president through an illegal coup. So the president, uh, again, uh, being harassed by the Judiciary Committee. Uh, and the and the radical Dems that make up now the the Democratic Party. What was the Democratic Party? They are to. What should the White House do? They're saying no, uh, and it's so refreshing to hear the Attorney General, uh, to hear uh, the White House Counsel say no, the President to say no. Uh, but where and how is this resolved in your judgment? The most likely result. 
Well, in a sensible world, there'd be a negotiation that would well, allow We could rule that one out. <laughs> But uh, what would happen is that Congress would have to authorize litigation against the Justice Department or against uh, uh, the Attorney General uh, to force compliance. And that litigation takes years. The Fast and Furious litigation, it only resulted in documents being produced to, to Congress. For instance, that was the contempt litigation of Eric mm -hmm. Holder uh, after Judicial Watch filed a FOIA lawsuit to get the documents separately. Uh, that it took, and they're still fighting in the Fast and Furious litigation. So what you're saying is that we have reached a point in this republic where a clearly unlawful pursuit of a subpoena uh, against the Attorney General of the United States uh, results in years of litigation without resolution until every, uh, every issue 